Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching The Daily Debrief. On the show today, we're talking about displacement, internal displacement uh, in Israel and in India. And we close with Turkey's continued persecution on prosecution also of the Turkish Medical Association. First up, Israel's new far-right government has reinforced the worst of fears and is set to evict residents of 14 Palestinian villages, a total of over 1,000 Palestinians including at least 500 children from their homes in the Masafir Yata area in the southern occupied West Bank. Israeli forces informed local authorities about the move on Monday, the 2nd of January, and have already started carrying out individual demolitions. Residents are facing the imminent danger, of course, of being forced out of their homes because of Israel's plans to build a firing range for the military in its locality. At least five houses have already been demolished on Tuesday by Israeli forces, and one family was served a notice on Wednesday to vacate their home. This is according to reports coming in from the Wafa agency. Israeli forces have also been confiscating lands belonging to public utilities, such as schools and even water tanks in the area for a sustained period now. Dr. Abdul Rahman covers the region for People's Dispatch and joins us now with all the details. Hi, Abdul. Uh, wh what is the latest from uh, Masafir Yata, Abdul? Well, as per the uh, reports and as per the uh, Twitter uh, feeds, uh, it seems that the Israeli uh, forces have given a notice to uh, the residents uh, in Masafir Yata. Around 14 villages have been uh, uh, given the notice through their heads, of course, asking them to uh, vacate their uh, houses as soon as possible because the, uh, otherwise they are going to uh, forcefully evict them. Uh, 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 and uh, there, there, are, there are reports that, that they already they have demolished some houses. Uh, uh, they have evicted around four and five, uh, four or five families already. Uh, there are also reports that they uh, confiscated uh, some uh, 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 tent, which basically was used uh, uh, as, a, as a temporary school. The school building had been demolished much earlier. Uh, uh, there were reports about how uh, Israeli forces are also uh, filling up the water bodies which were uh, dug up all these years because uh, Vasafir Atta is basically uh, falls in a semi-dry, a dry region, and here uh, finding water bodies uh, is difficult. Okay. So of course you have to dig wells and all. So um, Israeli army uh, uh, and authorities have, uh, it seems that they have by and large decided to uh, go ahead with the uh, um, their plan to create a firing range at uh, and di displacing thousands of uh, Palestinians from the Musafir Atta. And, um, and for that, they have started taking uh, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, forceful actions. Yeah. All right. Uh Abdul, this is a case that has been on for 20 years. The, these plans to build this firing range initially came up back in 1999 and have since then been on hold. Is that legal process now done and dusted? Uh, and, and where do these thousand or so Palestinians uh, end up? Well, uh, the, uh, you rightly pointed out that the case was quite is quite old. It started in 1990s. Uh, immediately after uh, the Oslo Peace Agreement, which was signed in 1994-95, uh, according to which uh, Israel got uh, a kind of exclusive rights uh, over the, what is called Area C, uh, which is the largest part of the West Bank area. B, West Bank was divided into three areas, A, B, and C. Uh, and uh, unlike A and B, uh, Area C, which is the majority of the West Bank, were kind of directly under control of the Israeli uh, Israelis. And they decided to uh, create a firing range there. D despite knowing the fact that there are more than 1,000 people living there, most of them are shepherds, agri uh, agriculturalist farmers. Um, uh, of course, uh, initially, they forcefully ev evicted most of the people from that reason. But uh, the, some of the NGOs and uh, the people there went to the court and uh, the court kind of revoked the expulsion. So the people moved back into the reason. Since then, the, the case was going on in different Israeli courts. Finally, it, had, uh, it was uh, decided in uh, last year, May, uh, by the Israeli uh, high court. Uh, final verdict was given. 
according to which uh, the court accepted uh, the uh, israel's uh, israeli uh, military's uh, uh, demand or plan to you know, create a firing range displacing, displacing thousands of palestinians uh, so yeah the case has been uh, it is a final uh, uh, um, that the final verdict has been given it was not implemented for all this while because of the confusion related to the government in israel it seems mm. now that the new government has taken uh, uh, power and there is a clarity about it which has a very aggressive agenda of kind of uh, uh, kind of displacing palestinians uh, acquiring more and more uh, palestinian land in the occupied west bank so i think this is a part of that particular process uh, which this uh, new government has undertaken uh, to kind of uh, so and they have a legal quote and quote excuse as also as someone uh, questioned it uh, i think you and question last year that uh, uh, which court uh, gives priority uh, for firing range uh, uh, over thousands of people uh, displacing thousands of people yeah. but the israeli court has done it and this is uh, by and large final but there are of course resistance by the palestinians uh, uh, both online and offline there are uh, there are groups which are resisting uh, the move and uh, i think it is not going to be easy uh, for the israelis to kind of uh, implement uh, uh, their plans their plans right thanks very much abdul that's all the time i think we also have today we move on to india where the story of displacement is never too far from wider politics and the narrative of development and progress in the north indian state of uttarakhand formed in the year 2000 out of uttar pradesh which is of course the most populous province in the country uh, it is a state which borders china in the north and nepal to the east and home to about 10 million people close to 10% of that population live in the city of haldwani which is also an important railhead for the himalayan parts of the state on the 5th of january over 50000 residents of haldwani had some relief after weeks of distress when a division bench of india's supreme court halted the demolition of over 4300 homes in the banbhurpura area pragya singh of newsclick joins us with more uh, pragya in the last story we were discussing uh, an israeli you know process of building a firing range in a part of palestine and thereby evicting a thousand people in the process and the united nations reaction to that by saying what kind of court would pick a firing range or prioritize a firing range uh, over the homes of people uh, it seems that's very much at the center uh, of the debate that's happening in this north indian state as well give us a sense of the overall story and where we are in terms of the legal aspects of it at this point right uh, siddhant so actually it was a moment of jubilation on 5th of uh, uh, january for a lot of residents of uh, haldwani basically in december 2022 last just about a fortnight ago the high court of the state of uttarakhand which is a hilly state which mm. means it's very very chilly winter there right now mm. uh gave an order that people who live in this particular locality in that town can be evicted and they could be evicted using force if necessary within a week the reason was that the court found that the land that they were uh, you know where their houses were um belonged to the railways now the genesis of this case itself how mm. it landed up in the court was that an individual in the year 2000 or so filed a public interest litigation now the public interest litigation is a very peculiar uh, form of litigation found in india which relates to uh, people trying to enforce the public's fundamental rights mm. but this particular petition was filed to evict these people so that a rail link could be built between the town of haldwani where these people live about mm. 50000 of them and uh, where uh, you know the state from which it was removed and carved out in the year 2000 which is uttar pradesh so sort of connection would be uh, built for transporting people from uttar pradesh to uttarakhand right. which were earlier one state now two so that is kind of unusual the legal constitution expert gautam bhatia has actually pointed this out uh, recently and his word actually carries a lot of weight mm. uh, where he says that the eviction notice uh, the eviction order was sort of illegal it it wasn't constitutional that even if people do not own titles to their land which we are not saying that they don't mm. but even if they do not it doesn't mean that you can sort of pick them up and throw them away yeah. so there was a lot of uproar about the fact that there go, there's going to be this eviction there was a lot of uproar that it's going to happen in the winter and also that these people had been living there for uh, some of them for uh, 40 50 years mm. some of them said they came to 
uh, this area during the partition of India. Right. And also it was said by uh, much of the media couldn't ignore the fact that there were a lot of Muslims who lived there. Mm. And the Muslims have been in the crosshairs of the uh, BJP, uh, which is ruling India and, you know, which has a right wing agenda uh, based on like a strong Hindu nationalistic agenda. So the right wing ecosystem, so to speak, mm. is actually not very happy with the Supreme Court, which said yesterday uh, on 5th December that, look, you cannot, cannot do this thousands of people overnight like yeah. this and it has scheduled another hearing for 7 February hmm. um, which we have to see what happens there right now it is just the uh, state government and other parties to the case who have hmm. to file their replies so presumably this will go on for a while for a while all right uh, which brings us to the next part of the conversation Pragya, which is that this kind of uh, what's referred to here in India as bulldozer politics uh, you know where you are threatened with literally your home being raised and again, it takes us back to what we were talking about with Abdullah and Palestine, where it's so much a part of the, the, the sort of scenario that there's a section of the right that actually celebrates this. Right. And we've seen this on the rise in India in the past to an alarming degree. Absolutely. You know, this whole idea, uh, you see, there are several things at play in the Halwani case and the Uttarakhand case. One is that, you know, the notion of development that has been sold by successive governments is to build more roads, build more highways. Mm -hmm. And all of, uh, build more train links, build mm. just just constantly, there's a constant construction going on. Now, yeah. India does need roads. It needs great connectivity, better connectivity. But is there compassion in the ideas that they're proposing? Does anybody stop to think that someone is losing out so that someone else gains? And I think that notion now with the current government in power has been completely lost. So if you can reach from the capital city to a town in the hills, which mm. is a pilgrim town in the same state, actually, mm. if you can reach it in six hours, then why not five? Why not mm. four? Why not three? Why not instantly? Mm. So this, what people are not realizing is that somebody is paying the price who might not actually be able to benefit from all these roads and highways you're building. The other aspect is that the government's responsibility is to provide housing Absolutely. The, you know, and livelihood. There are government buildings there, which, uh, which, which you know, include schools, mosques, temples. And, you know, you have allowed this to go on for very long because somewhere uh, you, you, did not, you did not think that you would reach a point in your politics where only road construction and highways mm. would be sort of, you know, f become a fetish for a certain section, a wealthy section of the society. Mm. And the poor end up paying the price, which is what, was, what has been averted here right now. Right. I just want to point out another thing. I brought some data. I know data is never interesting, but here it is. From 2014... To now, the central government, which has been the party that has been power at the center, mm. sanctioned 62,700 housing projects, out of which 27,000 or so were completed in the same state. But in the town, 4,400 houses were sanctioned, out of which it could complete 2,068 houses. Right. Right. Now, you have sanctioned 4,400 houses, and the number of houses which you You're know, demolishing. You had to, to demol you had yeah. decided to demolish was four thousand three hundred. Mm. So the state is building and the state is destroying, and one mm. doesn't know who is gaining or losing, and that's actually a very fundamental problem. We need to think about development itself and what its goals are, but you also need to think about you cannot build and destroy at the same time and justify one by the other. other. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Pagya. It also brings, I think, to uh, really front and center the clash of institutions and, and the political establishment that is ongoing uh, in India all right. the time. Uh, thanks very much. And finally, the Turkish government continues its repression of dissent and the functioning of civil society organizations uh, with the prosecution of executives of the Turkish Medical Association, which is, of course, one of the leading progressive and critical collectives of its kind in the entire region. PD reported earlier on the incarceration of the association's head, Dr. Shabnam Kurur Financhi, uh, on charges of spreading uh, propaganda, terrorist propaganda that is. Uh, on Jan 10th now, Ankara prosecutors will begin hearings against other executives on the vague premise of being members of a terrorist organization. And Avrachar of the People's Health Movement spoke to me earlier via video conference and has more details. Anna, good to see you uh, back on Daily Debrief. Uh, an important week ahead for uh, the Turkish Medical Association. Two important court hearings happening on the 10th and then the 11th. Uh, tell us a little bit about where things stand in terms of uh, the government and the stand, stand that it has taken, of course, against the head, we know, but also the association itself. 
Yes, that's right. So uh, if you remember, at the end of October, we already reported about uh, a crackdown on the Turkish Medical Association uh, in Turkey. So uh, the important bit is uh, to highlight is that the Turkish Medical Association is one of the most progressive uh, professional organizations in health that we can see in the world today. Uh, it has been uh, spearheading very progressive uh, stances uh, and stances in, um, in support of peace uh, since many, many years. And for that, they have been attacked by the government on many occasions. So on this last occasion, what we are seeing now uh, is that there's an apparent attempt to replace the leadership of the TMA uh, by a temporary leadership, which uh, would then lead to election. And the election, of course, could lead to anything, you know, if uh, uh, barring that... Uh, 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 barring that uh, opposition is mounted to what the government is uh, uh, is, is attempting to do. Yeah. So one one of the most important thing to to notice here is that uh, the TMA will appear in court. So the actually the members of the Central Committee of the Turkish Medical Association will appear in court next week on January 10th uh, in Ankara. So uh, this will be a, a further step in the attempt to replace them. Uh, we don't know at the moment what's going to happen on the tent. So there could be a decision to, to, to go ahead with this plan. Uh, there could also be an attempt to prolong the process because by prolonging the process, of course, uh, the association is uh, stressed and weaken, weakened in a way uh, to uh, to push them away from uh, from the other things that they are doing. Right. And, and are there any charges that have been framed at, at this point? Uh, what are they responding to or what are they uh, sort of facing when they go up in court? Uh, well, uh, the news is uh, from just ahead of, uh, of New, New Year's uh, is that the government had ready charges uh, for terrorism and supporting terrorist organizations against all members of the Central Committee. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that these charges uh, have not been, you know, pursued yet. So these are things that are uh, ready and that members of the Turkish Medical Association expect to happen quite soon. Mm. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the procedure is, uh, let's, well, it's actually procedural. Uh, it's an attempt to say that the leadership is not legitimate, that it should be replaced, and that uh, another round of elections should be should be put in place. All right, uh, Anna. How does this fit with the wider sort of uh, political scenario in Turkey at the moment? Uh, it's an election year, uh, of course. Uh, so, so, so uh, everything presumably gives up to that uh, end. Uh, yes, that's right. And that's also what, you know, what we've been hearing uh, from many professional organizations close to the, to the TMA, but outside of Turkey. So, um, and of course, it's important to remember that this whole story started with the arrest of Dr. Shevnan Finanje, uh, who is the elected uh, chairperson, president of the Turkish Medical Association. She's a well-known forensic expert and physician. Uh, so, you know, she's been involved in many peace initiatives. Uh, she has been involved in many initiatives that uh, are oriented towards protecting other freedoms, including the freedom of press. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Finanche is uh, still being held in custody uh, since October. Uh, sh there have been a couple of court hearings in the meantime. The next one is uh, going to happen only one day after after the hearing of the Turkish Medical Association, so on January 11th. Uh, and even in this case, it's quite unclear what's going to happen. So the, the, this is a case being pursued in the criminal court because uh, Dr. Finjanje is uh, facing charges of uh, spreading terrorist propag propaganda after uh, talking about uh, a possible uh, use of chemical weapons mm. uh, uh, in Kurdistan. Mm. So um, what's... Um, What's, what's happening here is that, um, and of course, this is not official information. No one is going on record to say that. But uh, the implications are that the current Erdogan government is trying to weaken the organizations that have 
a very strong record of uh, pursuing policies that are uh, the opposite of what the government is wanting uh, to see, uh, that have been successful uh, in achieving those, uh, and they're doing it uh, by different means. So, you know, if we look at the last one and a half years, the Turkish Medical Association, uh, led by Dr. Finjanje, uh, has been one of the main supporters of health workers' actions. They have been coordinating strikes and other actions in many parts of Turkey. Uh, and these actions have been important not only for the rights of the health workers, but also for access to healthcare in Turkey, uh, which has been deteriorating as in other parts of the world. Right. All right. Thank you so much for that update, Anna. And of course, we'll ask you to uh, track that story for us. Important uh, developments expected next week, of course, and have you back on the show uh, to talk about updates when you have them. Thanks. And that's all we have on this episode of The Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories, as well as all the other work we do. We also ask you, of course, to follow us on the social media platform of your choice, if you haven't already. We'll be back again, same time, same place, tomorrow. Until then, thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.